So I'm Timothy Barrett. I'm a paediatric uh, doctor based in Birmingham Children's Hospital. Uh, most of the time I spend looking after children with diabetes and hormone problems, and I uh, lead the rare Alstrom syndrome clinic that we hold for Birmingham Children's. I've also got a research post at the University of Birmingham where I lead a research team looking at rare forms of diabetes. So I think this Alstrom syndrome UK conference is fantastic because it's bringing together families, doctors and scientists, not just from England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, but from Europe as well. So we've got a real international feel here at the moment. And the point is we're trying to share information and knowledge, and that's the only way we're going to be able to go forward for a, for a future treatment for this condition. So to try and help children get an earlier diagnosis, I think Alstom Syndrome UK is vital really for widening the understanding and the awareness of Alstom Syndrome amongst health professionals. And from our point of view, we're trying to increase information to the health service through all of their websites, through their networks and their, and their research papers as well, and including it on all the guidelines for looking after children with rare diseases. So this conference has been really interesting for trying to learn new things about Alstom syndrome and one of the key messages that I take away from this meeting is hearing about the heart problems with some people with Alstrom and the fact that Dr. Seed says you can actually measure the heart changes over time and that makes me think it could be a really good marker for how the disease progresses and how it might respond to a future treatment. Well, if I was to presume to offer advice to any of our children and families with Alstom syndrome, I'd say try and go for a walk every day if you can, because that aerobic exercise is one of the things that we know can keep you healthy as you move forward into adulthood. And as a side of that, trying to eat healthily as well. I think coming to these sorts of conferences is very humbling for me because I meet families and really see what they go through every day as part of the condition. I suppose what I'd want to say is really that we're all together as an Austrian family. Once we're here, we're all to try and to support each other. And families, don't forget that. We're going to try and be with you on the journey as far as we can and keep looking to try and improve treatments as we go. I'm Bob Cram. I'm a consultant chemical pathologist with an interest in metabolic disease and I work at Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. The conference is an opportunity for everybody to network, to circulate. It's the ideal time for the families particularly to talk to the health professionals who come along. Really important time. Yeah, it's, it is all about awareness of the syndrome. Uh, it's usually in paediatric circles that that needs to occur and there's no doubt that because of the work that's being done here with Tim Barrett leading in the paediatric side uh, that there's a higher profile coming round to diagnosis. The, the key message really is to stimulate our uh, children who have got Alstrom syndrome to exercise in some form or another. Giving them that opportunity is really important. It is difficult because of hearing and uh, blindness, and so trying to prevent the progression and producing some exercise early on uh, will be a key issue that they should really take away from this conference. Well, I think one of the key points is that the, uh, the individuals with Alstrom should contact Alstrom uh, UK. There's support there. There's a very good network of support uh, available. And the expertise which has been building up over the years means that those families can reach out and get other families to discuss the problems that is common to them. So I believe very much that the society is the pivotal, has the pivotal role but certainly the clinical expertise that's gradually building up now uh, will help the society in the future. I think it's a marvellous society dealing with a very individual disease and it's really, over the years, it's developed really very well and, and seeing the society, how that development has helped make sure that research has started to take place has been really important. I think the, the work done by individuals 10 years ago is really beginning to pay off now. I'm Tarek Ken Haywat. I'm one of the metabolic consultants based at Birmingham University Hospital. Uh, we do look after a large number of patients with a rare disease and uh, Allostrom syndrome is also one of the services we run uh, for adult patients, yeah. 
I think the main thing it brings people uh, uh, from different actually experts, it brings patients and, and uh, I think it's good for us as a clinicians to hear the family's perspective, how they perceive, for example, we do research, what's actually family's perspective. So it is, uh, and also it's good to discuss with colleagues actually from other parts of the world, what they do and see how they manage, and how they care for patients. I think to actually make sure the diagnosis is made in, you know, in a timely manner, we need to increase the awareness of actually physicians at various levels, so pediatricians or family doctors or other specialist carers, because one of the problems with the patient, uh, the diagnosis takes several years for some. Uh, and some may actually have different diagnosis before the condition actually allostrom is confirmed. I think the key message is uh, even though allostrom is uh, a life, so the life threatening condition, uh, there's a lot we can do to actually people live longer. So the lifestyle, the exercise, and the patient's commitment to do that is very important. So uh, it is still treatable. Uh, I think my advice would be for individuals affected with Allostrom syndrome, uh, this is a condition you could live with it, and uh, this is a condition, there's a lot we could do to help, and it's a lot also the patient can do to help themselves, especially you know, in terms of actually healthy choice, diet, exercise, uh, in significantly impact on their uh, health, uh, you know, on the years to come. Yeah, so I'm Colin Johnson. I'm Professor of Medical and Molecular Genetics at the University of Leeds. It's always such a great uh, event. I really enjoy it. It's very nice to meet with uh, professionals, with the families. It broadens your uh, understanding and your horizons, and I think that there's certainly scope for uh, professional collaboration and certainly I think uh, with, with some people uh, continuing friendships as well. Well I think it's the way that um, it's at quite an informal um, level and that we can talk as professionals with the families of course and what's important for them but also talk to clinicians. I'm not a clinician myself but I'm, I need to understand the, uh, the condition that I'm researching so I think it's, you know, it's a very good uh, uh, broad mix of, of, uh, of interests and, in, um, and, uh, and abilities. Early diagnosis is vital. I think that um, uh, professionals need to be aware that uh, there are genetic tests that are very rapid that do give uh, very clear genetic diagnosis and really I think people um, on paediatric ward, for example, need to be aware of the presenting uh, features of this condition. So I think a, a bit more education, particularly about rare diseases because you know sometimes they are overlooked a bit. There's a lot known about the clinical presentation of patients and we know what the gene is and what the protein um, is called and, but we don't really know what it does and I think that that is a key pathway. The protein when it's, when it's mutated or when it's defective, you know, why is it causing these features in patients? And I think that's a really important question that really does need a lot more study. I, I really enjoyed the, the conference, I felt uh, very welcomed, very friendly and it's, it's great to be able to talk to my science to uh, an interested audience. Um, my name's Rebecca Perrin and I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds. Um, so for me, I'm a scientist and I spend a lot of my time in the lab. Um, we don't really have much contact with patients, so it's been really good to chat with them, find out what's important and find out what areas of research they're really interested in. So it has been really useful for me. Um, so my research is looking at primary cilia and we know that one of the major mutated proteins in Alstrom syndrome, the ALMS1 protein, localises to the base of the cilia and we're using a new microscopy technique to be able to look at that. Um, so it's really good to be able to talk to patients and let them know about new developments. Yeah, I'd just say it's like so important for us to communicate our research properly rather than just publishing articles and actually getting out there and talking to people about it. I mean, I think the website does a great job of that, but we really need to push it a bit more and just let people know what's going on so they're actually aware of it. And um, So thank you for inviting me to speak. It's been a really great day and I've had a really good time. Thank you. 
Um, so my name is John Pemberton, I'm the dietitian at the Birmingham Children's Hospital and I work specifically with the clinic that we run at the Children's Hospital for children with Alton Syndrome. For me, there, there are two big things for the conference. Personally, as a clinician, to come and hear what's the most up-to-date information for Alston Syndrome. Because the research that's out there is not easily accessible. There's not a lot of it, there's not a specific journal for it, so it's, it's spread about over numerous places. So to get the lead clinicians in one place allows me to catch up with everything that's going on in one hit, and hopefully then I can actually go and ask questions to the presenters because there's always elements that you don't understand and there's nothing better than being able to get face to face and say, is my understanding quite right about that? So that then you can translate that for the families when you see them in clinic. So that's the first element for me. And the second is to see the families in more of a relaxed atmosphere. Because when they come to clinics, it's all very much, you've got to see this person, and then the next person, and then the next person. You often don't get a chance to see them with their guard down socially so they can really get build a rapport, connect with people. And that allows you, when you see them in clinic, to say, right, let's drop the guard, let's get into the real stuff and actually see if we can help you rather than there being a defensive system up. So those are the two, two most important things for me.